Hello everyone. Today we shall talk about how we tackle some operational and capacity utilization challenges at Workday. For those of you who haven't heard of a Workday, it's a software as a service company that offers a single solution for finance, human resources, planning and analysis. Our presenters today are Bogdan Katinsky, Silvana Bubak and me, Imtiaz Chaudhary. Here's our agenda for today. First, I shall give a background of capacity management and operational challenges that we face, which comes with growth. Then, Silvano and Bogdan will discuss some of the technical solutions that we came up with to address these challenges. Now, let's get to the story. OpenStack is continuing to grow within Workday. Over the last few years, we've seen more and more applications running on OpenStack platform. As of now, we have approximately 39,000 VMs running on this OpenStack platform, over 45 clusters spread across five different data centers in the United States and in Europe. Just as with great power comes great responsibility, with bigger clouds comes tougher challenges. One of our challenges is to come up with an accurate capacity usage and growth forecast. We need accurate capacity information from all of our clusters, not only at the cluster level, but at each hypervisor level. It is important for two reasons. First, to be able to accurately predict whether in our weekly maintenance window, we can support any potential changes to the number of VMs we are launching. Second, we need a reliable growth forecast so that the platform can support any growing cap capacity needs of applications. Accurate forecasting is important because ordering hardware takes time and it even more so during a pandemic. Bogdan will explain how we ad address this. Another challenge we face is to optimize resource utilization. We run different types of workloads on our OpenStack clusters. Some are memory intensive, others are CPU intensive. With such different types of workloads, we noticed our hypervisors were underutilized. We needed to come up with an optimization scheme which maximizes capacity usage while reducing blast radius in case of a hardware failure or hypervisor failure. Silvana will elaborate more on this. And we also need to improve operational effi efficiency. That's by reducing the time it takes to apply patches to a server. Servers often require periodic firmware and software updates. These updates often require servers to be rebooted. Since rebooting a server affects any running workload, we wait for a long maintenance window, usually quarterly, to do such operations. Trying to reboot thousands of servers in a short maintenance window is non-trivial. It's risky and it slows down rollout of important firmware updates. But what if we could tweak the scheduler so that the VMs avoid hypervisors that require maintenance, thus allowing us to apply changes in smaller batches of hypervisors more frequently? And Silvana will elaborate more on that. With that, I hand it over to Silvana. Before I start to talk about changes in the scheduler, I want to talk about two metrics related to VM allocation. One important requirement for our VM placement algorithm is maximize the high availability of our applications. In short, means avoid deploy all instances of a project in the same host, so in case of the host dies, the impact is minimized. This is measured as blast radio and I want to show how we calculate in Workday. First, I want to show how to calculate for a single host. For example, for a given host X, if that host die for project A, there is a drop of 20% of project A capacity because the project A have one out of five VMs in host X. This is the blast rate for project A in host X. But for the whole host X, the brass radio is the maximum brass radio for any project running on that host. In this case, 
is 0.4 or 40 percentage. In Workday, we don't calculate brass radio for projects with 4 or less VMs in the cluster. This is why Project D doesn't have blast rate. To calculate the blast rate for the whole cluster, we use the average and the maximum blast rate for all individual hosts. Note a lower blast rate is better since it measures the drop in application availability. Fragmentation is also a metric that we aim to reduce. Fragmentation could be for any resource, but in Workday, our main concern is about memory. Fragmentation of memory measures how the space available in the cluster is spread over the host. For simplicity and make this meaningful to a broader audience in Workday, we measure fragmentation as the space available to deploy a VM that requires 240 GB of memory. When compared to different strategies of VM placement, the solution with less fragmentation is the solution that provides more space to deploy those big VMs. Note in this diagram, in the deployment case 2, despite the hosts have the same capacity as in the case 1, we can't deploy the second VM in the project B because the space available was split between two hosts. Also, the blast rate for both hosts is 1 or 100. This example is to emphasize how the order that we launch the VMs can change those metrics for the worse or for better. To give a perspective about how fragmentation is very important, in the past, in Workday, we were in a situation where a cluster with around 300 compute nodes and average memory utilization of around 80% and we couldn't deploy a VM with 240 gigabytes of memory because all space available is too fragmented over all hosts. Note 20% of capacity for a cluster of this size means around 30 terabytes of memory available, but no single host with 243. Out of the box, OpenStack already provides a solution to deploy different flavors, balancing fragmentation and brass raid. This solution is host aggregates. In Workday, we have used the approach of one host aggregates per flavor, except for flavor with memory below or equal 64 GB. Those flavors belong to the same aggregate. We develop a tool to adjust the host aggregates dynamically, based on the number of VMs per flavor. Using host aggregates is easier to achieve a good packing. That is a big pro, but there are limits with host aggregates. For example, when a flavor being used for only one project and doesn't require much capacity, could have all VMs in one or few hosts, increasing the blast rate. Another problem is when the capacity of one host aggregate reduces or project changes flavors. Look at this example. There are two flavors and two aggregates, one for each flavor. VMs are the orange box and host the blue box. Letters are the project name. VMs for project A and B are in the same aggregate because they have the same flavor. But if project A decides to change their flavor to flavor 2, let's see what happens. Since the capacity need to deploy flavor 1 reduce and the capacity need to deploy flavor 2 increase, I need to move few hosts from one aggregate to another. But moving the, the host does not change the VMs run on it. In our example, project A was redeployed as part of their capacity chain, but project B have no requirement to do a redeploy, and those VMs keep landing the aggregates for flavor 2. Host aggregates work well if you just grow capacity. If your capacity changes frequently, they are hard to maintain, requiring a lot of operational work and a lot of resource to keep migrating instances from one host to another. But we plan to change the way OpenStack chooses hosts. How can we ensure there is no capacity issues? How to ensure we are not increasing fragmentation and brass rate? We develop a simulation tool that means what the scheduler does. That makes it easier to load the data from a cluster and simulate different placement strategies. The simulation tool was developed in JavaScript to be more interactive. Just a static page with JavaScript doesn't require any backend. Filtering and waiting are simple to write in JavaScript. A Python script extracts the cluster information 
in JSON format. The tool receives as input a cluster definition. That is the list of all hosts, all flavors, and all VMs running on the cluster. Also, the scheduler multipliers. In the chart, X axis contains the hosts, three in this example. In the Y axis is how much resources are in use without overcommit, so can go over 100. The bar is the amount of memory consumed by VMs in the host, and the line is the amount of CPU. Bar have different colors depends on the flavor. In the bot, we can simulate, create, and destroy VMs. Any create will execute using the new multipliers. You can simulate deploy one or few VMs, but also redeploy the entire cluster with new parameters. After many tests and simulation, using our simulation tool, we found a way to balance the blast rate and fragmentation in Workday. No more host segregates management and VM migrations. Note one important goal of this first implementation is to have an algorithm that is simple enough to understand why a host was chosen. In our proposal, all suitable hosts are available in each deployment, different from host aggregates where just a limited set of hosts are available. This maximizes the capacity available and reduces the blast rate. To achieve this, we use a feature in the scheduler called waivers, where hosts can be preferred but not limited. Because we want to minimize the fragmentation, Workday uses a memory waiver with multiplier minus one to stack the VMs. Note that alone increases the blast rate because the scheduler will try to stack all VMs in the same host. To reduce the blast rate, we combine the memory waiver with our own implementation of soft antifint waiver. Different from what OpenStack offers out of the box, our way here is configurable to accept four VMs in the same host before starting to spread. Also, it doesn't require a server group. We use the project ID to know if two different VMs should be placed together. This way here has a higher priority and has a multiplier minus two because the development is actually soft, uh, soft affinity. The negative multiplier always invert the order. I will explain why we choose the scale of multipliers later. Here are the results after change the scheduler. Note a huge improvement in capacity due to the reduced fragmentation. For most clusters, the average blast rate has increased a little, while the max blast rate has reduced. And because the solution is stack, the number of hosts needed is lower than before. Just to clarify the capacity to launch the 240GB VM are after we have executed all deployments. Periodically, some patches need to be applied on the host, like security patches. As the number of compute nodes increase, this is becoming harder because our maintenance time does not have increased. But this procedure could be fully automated if the schedule is also aware of the maintenance. Because this is not specifically maintenance, the decision is based on host uptime. Hosts running longer get less priority on the deployment. After some time, they will become empty. Weekly, all empty hosts are patched and restart. After restart, the uptime is zero and the host gets higher priority on deployment and the second group of hosts with longer uptime will become empty. The uptime information is cached on the scheduler to avoid performance issue. The uptime on blast rates and fragmentation is negligible because the uptime can assume just few discrete values. For a specific host maintenance, we still use the regular procedure to disable host. But this solution gives us the maximum number of hosts empty to be patched without compromising the capacity. The first idea how to weight the host based on overtime time was to give a plus one weight on every 60 days, for example. So there is no difference between a host up in for 10 days and up for 50 days. But after we analyze the distribution of uptime among all compute nodes in all clusters in Workday, we realize is necessary a more sophisticated formula. 
to ensure the uptime waiter can assume no more than three distinctive values. Those three values divide the host in three groups based on the uptime, minimize the impact of rat rate and fragmentation. Next, next slide, I will explain that better. This slide explains why we choose multiplier 1, 2, or 3 for the way here. I'm oversimplifying here, but hopefully that gives everybody an idea how to make a choice. First, note that all way here have their values normalized between 0 and 1. In these diagrams, focus on the host with weight 0. Because the uptime weight is multiplied by 3, the winner host is in this group. But in the group with uptime weight 0, the uptime is no more relevant since all hosts have the same weight in uptime. Same idea for the anti-affinity. Few hosts have more than 4 VMs of same project running, and the remain have not. So, the memory multiplier will make the final decision in the last subgroup. Let's talk about some of the challenges and requirements for capacity management at Workday. First of all, multiple independent microservices run on the platform and each may need to increase their capacity at a different time, for example, when releasing a new feature. A central deployment plan controls the service deployment. In the past, the deployment plan was stored in a SQL database and requests to update it were submitted by Jira. This process was error prone and, on, and moreover, before updating the deployment plan, engineers responsible for capacity management would only check if the total amount of RAM, CPU or disk is enough to increase the footprint of a service. And they didn't take into account how fragmentation and the order in which services are deployed affects the capacity. In the past, we had issues during our weekly maintenance window caused by a too large increase in the capacity of one of the services. Because of those issues, we made a requirement that the new capacity management process needs to validate if there is enough capacity taking into account fragmentation and also how the deployment order may affect capacity. On top of those issues, when a capacity issue occurred during a maintenance window, it was difficult to find which services updated their capacity most recently. So, we also made a requirement that the new process has to make finding and reverting the most recent capacity changes easy. Another good to have feature was to make capacity management self-service. So, instead of submitting Jira requests, which had to be copied to the deployment plan by the infrastructure team, we let service teams make changes in the deployment plan directly but still give the infrastructure team the power to approve or reject them. At the beginning, we were considering building a new tool with a web UI, but then we realized that we have the solution already available. We picked Git with Gerrit as the code review tool and Jenkins as it fits the business requirements perfectly. And most of the users already know and use Git every day, so we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Additionally, treating capacity changes like code gives us all the benefits of a CA pipeline, including tests. I will walk you through that later. Okay, so let's dive deep into how the new Git plus Jenkins workflow works in our capacity management system. This diagram shows the process of changing the capacity for one of the services. It all starts with a member of the service team updating capacity in a YAML file with the deployment plan. This change triggers the validation job running on Jenkins, 
which checks if there is enough capacity to increase the footprint of one of the services. Finally, the EnfOps team, which is the gatekeeper of capacity requests, gets a chance to review and approve the change. Merging the change to the main branch triggers another job on Jenkins, which updates the SQL database used by the deployment tool, so the next service deployment will use the updated deployment plan. Let's now have a closer look at how the capacity check from the previous diagram works. For this check, we use the same simulation tool that we use to simulate the changes in the scheduler, which Silvano talked about. Because we use Cube Jenkins, we can package the simulation tool and all helper scripts needed to run the capacity check in a Docker container. The data on the physical capacity of our clusters is stored in Ceph and is periodically refreshed by a cron job which runs on each cluster. The validation test pulls the cluster capacity data, reads the updated deployment plan from Git, reformats the plan to meet the input format of the simulation tool and runs a series of simulations. We simulate the best case deployment ordering, the worst case ordering and the number of random deployment orderings. If all simulations are successful, the job gives the change a plus one approval, which is a required but not a sufficient condition to merge the change. If, on the other hand, at least one of the simulation fails, Jenkins returns a minus one to Garrett with an error message explaining how much capacity needs to be added to the clusters to make room for the new deployment plan. In addition to approving or rejecting changes, the simulation tool generates data which can be used to visualize and summarize the state of all clusters after deploying the new deployment plan. The data is again in JSON format and we use Jenkins Archive Artifacts plugin to archive this data together with a static HTML file and JavaScript code, which contains an application to browse and visualize the data. Since the simulation tool is written in JavaScript, we can reuse the same modules to generate graphs and render tables with the results directly in the browser. The graphs are interactive with a dynamic legend and labels which appear after hovering over a data point. We also present tabular data with some key metrics related to capacity and the deployment. So what are some of the key lessons that we learned? First, we learned that capacity optimization is a tough problem. Deciding on what to optimize itself is the biggest challenge. In our case, we defined the notion of blast radius and fragmentation to determine what to optimize on. Simulating against real data from all our clusters helped come up with a good optimization algorithm. Second, when you're optimizing, account for all types of scenarios and resources. For example, IP address. If someone requests to increase the number of VM they're launching on your cloud and you don't have enough IP address for that project, that itself can be a problem. Also to take into account is the deployment model for an application or microservices. For example, if someone uses blue-green deployment, then they may require uh, for a short period double the capacity when they're rolling out a new version of the application. Finally, we learned that Nova Scheduler itself is very extensible. We gave you examples of how we managed to optimize resources by writing a plugin without requiring any changes to the main Nova code.